Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. Near Marysville in Mason County in Kentucky, a woman stated that a Bigfoot chased her around her car at the Central Shopping Precinct. On to the next one. In Harlan County in Kentucky, me and my brother-in-law were going to work. I saw something ahead of us kneel down alongside the road. As we approached, it stood up and walked backward into the center of the road, squatted and looked right at us, then leapt over to the embankment. It was about seven feet tall, big legs, small upper body with thin, longer hair on the chest and arms, short neck, and short, thick hair on the legs, dark brown in color. We got to within 20 to 30 feet of it, our headlights on bright. The road stays in bad condition. Travel is very slow. A bag of garbage torn apart was found where the animal was seen kneeling. It was 3 a.m. and was very clear with a moon overhead. And it was very cold. About two weeks later, another person saw the same thing running across the road. On to the next one. In Bell County, near Parrot Lake, across the road from the Smith Farm, on the hillside near Chinoa, many sightings were in the local area by the community. A root cellar was broken into, door torn off its hinges. Two men were chased down from the mountains, and their pack of hunting dogs were whipped by something. The creature chased the dogs down the mountain, screaming. These dogs have killed a bear before. It chased them, running and breaking trees as it went. One of the men was a two-term Vietnam vet, and it scared him so bad he threw his gun down and ran. It took them two weeks to find their dead dogs or recover the ones still alive. The eyes were glowing red. A friend of mine was walking with me, and he saw it first and asked me what I thought it was. It was dusk and the sun was just setting. The creature was peeking from behind a tree, approximately 15 feet away on the edge of the tree line by the road. On to the next one. I went to pick up a friend at her parents' home for an evening out about one half mile south of Strawberry. There is a dirt lane that leads between a quarter to a half mile from the highway to their home. This lane cuts through a ponderosa pine forest. It was on this lane, on our way back to the highway, that we saw the Sasquatch. He entered from out of the woods on our left, crossed the dirt lane in front of us, and entered the woods on our right. Although it was after dark, we were able to see him quite clearly in our headlights. We were moving slowly. I would estimate him to have been about seven feet tall and to have weighed about 400 pounds. He was covered in a light-colored hair, similar to that of a camel in color. He walked upright on two legs and had the gait of a human, as his arms swung in time with his step. He never looked directly at us, but continued to look straight ahead and to maintain his stride across the lane. He did not seem to appear scared or startled by the presence of our car or its headlights. It was as if he knew that he had time to cross the lane in front of us. His body shape was not like that of a bear. It was proportioned out to that of a man of that height and weight, but it had a barrel chest. My friend and I were both surprised by it, but were not uneasy about it because he did not make any menacing gestures. It seemed like it paid no attention toward us at all. My biggest regret now is that I did not return the next day to look for footprints. Even though he did not appear menacing, 
I certainly would not have followed him into the wood. I've often wondered if he could have possibly used our headlight on purpose to illuminate his path across the lane. On to the next one. It was our annual summer camping trip, and I was in the back of the car with my uncle. My grandmother and grandfather were in the front, and my grandma and uncle were sleeping. I was staring out the side window and slightly forward. While looking, I saw a large animal that I thought was a bear. It was only a very brief view, but the animal was walking upright and was very furry. I mentioned to my grandfather that I saw a huge bear walking upright, but he laughed and said it must have been trying to climb a tree. But there was a break in the trees where I saw the creature. It looked like it was going off the side of the road into the forest. I cannot be sure what it was, but it was so very odd that it certainly looked like it was walking on two legs. It was dark, so I couldn't distinguish any other features. On to the next one. In Coconino County, about 30 miles from Camp Verde, I was hunting deer with a friend. On the third morning, right at dusk, we headed out to hunt some deer. I told my friend to hike up this mountain and follow it until he comes down on the other side. And I would hike up midway and do the same in hopes of spooking some deer. We were to meet on the backside at the bottom of the mountain and the top side of a wash. After about 10 minutes into the hunt, I saw a fox to my right and ahead of me. He was about 70 yards away and heading in the same direction but in front of me. I kept watching him, and every so often, he would stop and turn around the opposite of me and look back. I looked back over my right shoulder, and about 120 yards away, I saw this figure, brownish-black in color, about seven to eight feet tall and very broad, walking down in the wash. It was looking at me and continued walking deeper into the wash to where I couldn't see him anymore. I only saw him for about five to eight seconds. I wish until this day that I would have used the scope on my rifle up and got a real close up. I told my friend about this, but nobody else until about 15 years later. The creature seemed to not want anything to do with me and I of it. I think that the fox was spooked from the creature and surely not me. We hunted that same area for a few more days and several years later after that and I never saw anything like it since. On to the next one. We were on our way back from Las Vegas, Nevada, going around 89A over the mountain road of Jacob Lake and north rim of the Grand Canyon. My aunt thought it would be fun to play in the snow, so we pulled over. We were in a type of gorge where the road cuts through the mountain. As we were playing, I thought I could hear someone yelling. It was loud because I heard the sound over my cousin's snow fight. I guess my aunt heard the same thing because she had a weird look on her face. As we were ready to leave the area, we all heard the second howl. This time, it was loud and clear and deep so we hightailed it out of there. My aunt did not want to know what made that noise. I believe the howl I heard was not from the local wildlife. On another occasion, there was no noise, but me and my cousin were fishing down in Oak Creek Canyon, north of Sedona, Arizona, when we stumbled across tracks and a net. On to the next one. About 15 years ago, my girlfriend at the time and I took a trip from our home in Albuquerque, New Mexico to Los Angeles to visit my mother. On our trip home, we decided to stop by the Grand Canyon in Arizona because she had never seen it. We got there pretty late in the afternoon and we stayed to view the sunset over the canyon. We departed for Flagstaff soon after it had gotten dark. We headed down a less traveled stretch of road as a shortcut. I do admit that I don't remember the highway number. The road had next to no traffic on it, and my friend and I took advantage of the time to talk. The highway was very curvy, and we had just come out of a turn into a fairly long straightaway when we noticed something walking down the right side of the road on the shoulder. Note, 
The rest of this took place in a matter of a few short minutes, although it seemed like an hour. What we saw was walking upright like a man, but was noticeably larger. As we got closer, my girlfriend said, Is that a bear? It was at that moment that it became visible that our companion on the road was covered head to toe in brown to light brown fur or hair. It was also at that moment that I realized what we were looking at. I had seen enough TV and heard enough hunting stories from my dad. I stopped the car. Our headlights now shone into the area that the Bigfoot could see them, and it stopped as well. We were about 50 yards apart at this point, maybe closer. It then turned to face us. I'll never forget this moment. It is burned into my memory. At first, the animal turned its head slightly to look back, but its head seemed to be attached at its chest, so it had to turn completely to face us. We didn't make a sound. We were in complete shock. Our friend was about seven feet tall and covered head to toe in hair. The body was somewhat without definition, as in, I didn't make out features like hips or gender. The arms seemed to be abnormally long maybe to just above the knee. The face was mostly hairless and looked, well, without something else to compare it to, kind of like a character from Planet of the Apes. Not exactly, but this creature definitely was from the ape family with just a touch of human look. The eyes seemed to glow a bit green, like a cat or dog in the headlight. It stood there for a matter of seconds, and I could tell that it was thinking about its next move. It ran its tongue across the front of its upper teeth in pondering. It took one small step in our direction. My girlfriend went berserk. She screamed in horror. It stopped its forward movement, looked around, and headed into the woods near the road in a couple of strides. We never got another look at it. My girlfriend quickly got it together and wanted out of the area. I agreed. We took off and I made a wide turn around the area that the Bigfoot had once stood. I never got the feeling that it meant us any harm, but was very curious about what we were. You couldn't convince my girlfriend of that, though. The event shocked her for life, and she refused to ever talk about it again. To this day, I'm sure she has blocked it out. I, on the other hand, will never forget it. But it did take me years before I could tell my wife about my encounter. I'm only posting my story now for my own therapy, and the hope that it will help someone else who has gone through something like this. The whole time I could see from the body language and face movements that the animal was thinking out its next move. It was very cautious about us. On to the next one. I grew up in Bangor, Maine, and my father was a junior partner in the sporting goods business. I cannot mention the company because my dad's retirement clause prohibits the use of names. I'll simply say that father had worked for the same company since he graduated from college, so there were a lot of perks. I mention this only to say that our family benefited from those bonuses, myself probably more than the rest, even though I'm a female. Since my brother had joined one of the major auto manufacturing corporations in the United States, I happily filled the spot that normally would have been made for a male in the corporate succession ladder. I soon realized that being a girl was a token figure, primarily useful for public relations, although I doubt I was taken as seriously as a man would have been. I purely loved traveling with father as I was introduced to some of the most terrific sporting personalities in the world. Over a period of several summers prior to entering college, I attended what were known as high-level meetings where my opinion was often sought so as to represent the company's fast-growing product segment that catered to the female sports person. My big break came during my second year of college, as the company was opening several more franchises in Canada, and they made me an offer. Thanks to Dad's influence, I admit, but I will also admit to being a perfect fit for the position. 
this was too good of an opportunity. So I took a break from school so I could see what would be required knowledge for my new position when I continued my schooling, which the company offered to pay for. The first assignment was to move to Halifax, Nova Scotia, and my fellow employees were marvelous. They took me under their wing, like a member of their family, and I assimilated quickly. The company had taken my advice and closed the deal for our newest franchise, so my job now was to totally devote my time to ensure that we gave our full support to the success of this brand new location. I know I'm rambling, but the memories of those days are so rewarding that I get caught up. So let me get to my experience with the scariest animal I've ever seen. Several of us employees began to bond soon after we first met, and before long, we were a close circle of eight people. With similar interests, our main organizer, Paul, had been with this group for a long time before they became our franchise, and being the newcomer to the team, I was satisfied to merely be a part of the fun. Before long, we had narrowed down to an almost inseparable six. We had many common interests, but our main hobby was sailing. Here's where I finally get my story out. I was on a boating jaunt on my friend Jeannie's father's yacht. Her dad took us on a four-day trip from his moorage in Dartmouth, and we met a business associate from Sydney at Port Hawkesbury, which was a point between where they were purchasing a piece of land at the port facility. Jeannie and I hung around on the yacht, and the second day we were headed back toward Halifax when Jeannie's dad got a call from a real estate developer saying he wanted to meet him at Mahone Bay to discuss a real estate development at Oak Island. Back then, this place had not received the notoriety it has today. It was just a small island off the coast near Lewenberg. Sure, we knew that the place had been the topic of a lot of stories about pirate treasure and strange happenings, and I hadn't lived in the area long enough to learn much about it. But, also, I had zero interest in exploring for old coins and digging in holes where snakes lived. Anyway, we soon dropped anchor off a small island about 600 to 1,000 feet from the shore. There was a small marina-like area on the mainland, with a parking lot for vehicles and docks, evidently for visitors and the people who had homes that I could see the roofs of as the island was higher than our deck. Jeannie and I didn't pay much attention, as a small powerboat picked up her dad and left for Oak Island. One of the crewmen went along, and the other two remained on the boat with us. We were swaying slightly, and the anchor rope had enough play in it that soon we were floating close enough to get a clear look at the shoreline. The ship's binoculars certainly made for close-ups of the flags and the stakes where the lots for sale were stretched out from the house and some other building, of which we could only see a roof because of the island's height. I think I must have been watching long enough to have been half asleep when I became aware of an animal moving in the overgrown weed down along the shore. I looked over at Jeannie, and she was slumped over, sound asleep. I shook her awake and whispered for her to look. And as she turned to where I was pointing, another, much bigger animal joined the first one. They just stood there, eating berries from the bushes. I assumed them to be raspberries or similar, but I suddenly woke up enough to realize I was not looking at an animal I was familiar with. These were not normal wildlife. Jeannie finally broke from her trance-like state and as she turned to me, she said, Sasquatch. As we both watched through our binoculars, the animals didn't seem as though they were even aware of our being there. Of course, the ever-present wind blew constantly across this vast waterway. Then, as we were staring open-mouthed, Jeannie's dad came over the hill with the other man and his crewmen. 
Her dad and the man in the suit shook hands, and the man went back up the hill as her dad returned to the boat. He was soon on the yacht, and as the boat was raised to its sling, we regaled her dad on the animal we had been watching. Jeannie's dad joined us on the deck, and as he was served a scotch by his white-frocked crewman, he settled into a lounge chair as we continued our story. When we finally ran out of breath, her dad filled me in on why he hadn't thought to tell me that I may see one of these Sasquatch. He said the locals accepted them, and seldom had there been any problems with the big animals. They never had any confrontations because the beasts seemed terrified when coming upon people, but they weren't scared enough to stay away when the berries were ripe. The locals kept silent about Sasquatch because they were known to be several better publicized areas nearby, and the islanders didn't want the trash bathers and their cameras everywhere near. As our boat powered away, I took one last look back, but there was not a sign of the creatures. Evidently, there were a great number of areas in that wild country where colonies of them lived all year round in harmony with the local people. On to the next one. Prior to this event, I used to ridicule those who spoke of Bigfoot. I mean, I was anti-Bigfoot to the point of cursing you out if I heard you talking about this monster. But that all changed. In August, while hunting wolverines in the Beartooth Mountains of Montana, I was three days out in the hunt spending every night under the stars, and tracking every day. I'd already bagged one wolverine and was hoping for another. I have to say that I was a darn good tracker, and to me, it was more about honing my skill set at tracking than it was about shooting anything, being more about the track and the sighting than it was about the takedown. On the third day of the hunt, I was hot on the trail of another wolverine and was working my way through a path in the Beartooth Mountains. There was a long and gradual slope running up the side of a mountain on my right, which was both wind and rain rutted, with a pile of rocks and large boulders here and there. I knew the tendencies and patterns that were associated with these critters so well that I wasn't walking with my head down but rather occasionally glancing here and there to make sure I was still square with what I was following. Rarely things would get a little trashed, particularly around rock formations, so I would have to stop and refocus my track. Other than that, I was pretty much walking like you or anyone else would. The sky was azure blue and cloudless, and it was about 9.30 in the morning. So, there I was, walking along, when a big rock came into my field of view on the right side and went across about 40 feet in front of me, bouncing and rolling to a stop. The first thing I did was look to my right and see nothing as I was still somewhat looking at the slope. I went to retrieve the rock. Now, holding it in my hand, this rock weighed about three or four pounds. And looking front on at the sloping side of the mountain, the closest place where any type of cover at all was, at least a couple of a hundred feet away, being some of these piles of rocks and boulders, I knew what had just happened, and this was by no means a dream or hallucination. Something had just thrown a large rock two if not more hundred feet across the path in front of me. I knelt down and stared at every aspect of this hillside, waiting for something to reveal itself. And then it happened. Out from behind one of these boulder piles, a head covered in dark fur leaned out from behind a rock, looked in my direction, and then leaned back behind the boulder. Before I continue, I have put lead in every variety of creature in the state, and I knew what I was looking at and not looking at. Just to give you a short list of some of the larger animals I've taken, I'm talking about black bear, grizzly bears, bighorn sheep, 
bobcat, Canadian lynx, caribou, moose, mountain goat, and mule deer, and that is just the short list. I stood there staring, and I remember mouthing to myself, son of a bee, a Bigfoot. I knew immediately what it was. Not wanting to let on that I was staring at it, I turned to my left while looking out of my peripheral vision in the hope that it would expose itself again, and it did. It stuck the side of its head out and appeared to be looking with one eye, watching what I was doing and then it ducked behind the rocks again. To me, the thought came to mind that it was somewhat stupid, and I will tell you why. It reminded me when I was pulling in my driveway one night, and a raccoon ran up a tree being scared by my approach. This raccoon, with my bright beams on it, kept peeking out from behind the tree to look at me, as though it was hidden and I didn't see it. This Bigfoot acted in the same way, in that we were eye to eye for about 15 seconds for the first time I saw it, and it apparently didn't make the connection. The funny thing was that this pile of boulders it was behind was not all that high at all. The largest of the boulders was maybe three or four feet tall, which led me to believe it was lying down behind it. In my mind, I wasn't going to leave until I saw it stand up and walk wanting a complete and unequivocal confirmation of this sighting. So, I began to kind of wander around as though I was looking at the ground, gradually moving further away from the slope while keeping a side view of the hill at all times. If and when it did move, it would have to do so completely in the open, and I knew it. For 30 minutes, I kept doing this, and twice I saw it move its head out from behind rocks as it had before. Finally, I decided to move on a southeast angle toward the trees, which were several hundred yards away from where I started. The Bigfoot stood up, then ran down and away along the slope. It was taking enormous leaps and bounds, something in the neighborhood of what I would estimate to be 15 or 20 feet per leap which was absolutely amazing to see. It was huge and burly in shape, with the prototypical huge feet and long arms that everyone has spoken about. Based purely on my evidence of what the largest boulder, being about four feet tall when the Bigfoot launched, and I do mean launched, it was more than likely eight or nine feet tall. It was dark brown with red hues to its hair. The sun was shining on it, like a long-haired pony, and I could see some of the long hair trailing behind it as it bounded down the slope. It was utterly remarkable as I watched it run about 150 yards and out of sight. I stood there, wondering what the Bigfoot was doing there, where it was lying down, and why had it thrown the rock in the first place. This is a question I have no answer for. Why bring attention to yourself only to hide? This thing was so big and fast and obviously strong that I thought it may have been at a higher elevation, trying for a bighorn. But then I realized that there are a lot of small creatures hidden in the nooks, crannies, and rocks of the mountains that would be easy pickings for such a beast. I never saw the Bigfoot again in Montana, and four years later, I moved to South Carolina for a good job. I had spent thousands of hours tracking in all corners of the state over many years, having never seen a print or any indication of them being there. That was part of the reason I would never get so pissed off when people claimed had they seen them. I think that if anyone would see them, it would have to be me. Well, now I had... On to the next one. I was in the U.S. Army, stationed at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. During this period of my military career, I was assigned to the post-drill team. As part of our duties, we did functions such as parades, special ceremonies, and military funerals. Fort Huachuca is approximately 70 miles south of Tucson. 
I remember it was a day in July, on a Saturday morning. We had to do a funeral in some small town in Arizona. I don't remember the name of the town. What I do remember is that it was a beautiful day, not a cloud in the sky. It was a perfect day. If you know anything about Arizona, it is desert, and on a clear day, you can see for miles. We loaded on the military bus, and we started on our trip. Right outside the gate from Fort Huachuca is a small town called Sierra Vista, which is a small military town, basically. There is a main road that leads from Sierra Vista that goes up to Highway 10, which is the major highway that runs through Arizona. I forget the highway number of the road that leads to Highway 10, but I'm sure if you look on any map, you could find that out. We turned left on the road and started to drive towards Highway 10. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes to get to Highway 10. After we got to Highway 10, we turned right, headed north. We were driving about 10 or 15 minutes, and suddenly the bus starts to jerk. The driver pulls over, and there we are, on the side of the road. Everyone got out of the bus but me. I was sitting on the left-hand side of the bus, or the driver's side, and looking out of the window at the passing traffic. On the far side of the road, I could see a big white house with a road leading from it. This is very important, because I'm sure that house is still there. I think it was some kind of ranch, actually, but I remember that it was all white. Anyway... I'm sitting there looking across the road and an 18-wheeler was coming up the far side of the road on the other side heading south. Just as the 18-wheeler passed, I saw something coming up out of the gully on the far side of the road. I'm sure you know how when you see something, first you see it, then your mind processes what it is. My first thought was, is that a bear? Then... As the thing kept coming up the embankment, I could see that it was walking on two feet. That's when my mind then asked, is that a gorilla? I remember it was dark tan in color with long hair. You could also see it was very muscular and it had these long flowing arms. As it came up the embankment, it turned its head and it was like time stopped. When I looked in its face, I actually saw man-like features. It's hard to explain, but it was like a big, hairy man. From its facial expression, I could tell it was frightened. It actually ran with its head looking back for a good distance. I truly believe that the sound of the 18-wheeler scared it. Back a little ways, I told you about the white house and the road leading from it. I sat there for, oh, at least 45 seconds watching it run up this road. You should have seen how fast it could run and how long the strides were. It was amazing. It was also a very hot day, as days are in Arizona, but it was like it ran with ease. Then it turned off the road to the left and it was gone into the desert. I just sat there in disbelief for a long time and then realized what I just witnessed. A sighting of Bigfoot itself. Needless to say, none of my friends saw it because they were playing around on the other side of the bus. For the rest of the day, I could think about nothing but that. Later that night, when my mind was thinking clearer, I had time to make some assumption. After my sighting occurred, I had time to think about what had happened. For some reason, this creature came down to the road. Why, I didn't know, but I don't think it was trying to cross from the look on its face and the way it was running. I got the impression that the 18-wheeler actually scared it. It was running at full speed up the embankment. I truly think its curiosity got the best of it until the sound of the big truck scared it. I also wondered why no one else on the bus or highway saw it because it was so big. I don't know how it got down in the gully, but... Unless someone, just by chance, looked out their passing car window, I could see why it went unseen. I also noticed that the color of it, which would make it very hard to notice, especially in the desert, 
If it saw someone coming, all it would have to do is kneel down and it would go unnoticed. An assumption of mine is that this creature has learned how to go unnoticed. I truly believe it is intelligent and can probably get very close to humans without it even being detected. Another thing I must say, other than a picture, footprint, video, or a dead body, it is going to be very hard to prove this creature exists. As far as shooting one, I guess that is a possibility. But if that does happen, it would be out of fright or because a person thinks it is a bear or something. I say this because if you look at this creature in the face, you are going to see so many features that a man has that it would be almost murder to shoot one. It is just so manlike in the face. From the distance I was at, it would be hard to say how tall it was, but I would put it over six feet easily. As far as the weight, it would be hard to estimate, but I would have to guess at least 300 pounds. The thing that impressed me more than the face, though, was its powerful build. Broad shoulders, wide body, and you could see the muscle in the arm and its legs were very strong and muscular. After I had a long time to think about it, I almost felt sorry for the creature because I can only imagine that it lives a lonely life all alone. I do think it enjoys its freedom, though, and it is truly the ruler of its domain. In the end, though, I truly think we will find proof one day, if for nothing, but because man is expanding all over the place, and this creature's curiosity with man might get it into a situation it cannot get out of. It is going to be very hard for this creature to hide forever, but for some reason, I know it will try. I have had 20-20 vision all of my life. I again have kept this to myself all my life because who would believe such a story? Sometimes I don't believe it myself. It's funny now though. Sometimes I'm sitting around watching TV and I see all the shows about whether Bigfoot is real or not. And I just shake my head because one day man is going to get the shock of its life because this creature is out there. I know. I saw it with my own eyes. Again, I don't want any recognition or fame. I just wanted to finally share this story with someone. I also cannot speak on the other sightings as to their truthfulness or not. What I do know is there is at least one in Arizona somewhere. One suggestion, though, is if someone really got serious about finding this creature with today's technology, you would think it would be easier. One technique I think would work is to go up in a helicopter or plane with infrared heat sensing equipment. One thing I know is that it is a hot-blooded creature, and if someone could finance it and have the patience to track it, I think you would hit pay dirt. Oh yeah, one other thing. Unless you drug this creature or shoot it dead, I would hate to be on the team that tried to capture it. From what I saw, if you corner this creature, it would have the strength to rip your head off your body. On to the next story. In Graham County, we had turned off on a dirt trail and headed back a bit. We were not at Riggs Lake yet, and we were past the first major cabin area. The nearest town was Safford, and the nearest road was Swift Trail. I had never thought about reporting this until I read about the report on Mount Graham. I lived in the Gila Valley as a child and visited Mount Graham as a child with relative from Michigan. I was 10 years old. I was sitting on a log with a slope behind me and started feeling funny, like something was watching me. My family called me back to the car. I glanced up behind me and there was something huge and dark partially behind a boulder right up the slope from me. I ran as fast as I could. It was hairy and tall. I hadn't heard anything before the sighting occurred. I told everyone and was told I was seeing things. I have never forgotten that visit to Mount Graham. As an adult, I am still freaked out up there. I know what I saw. It was not a bear. It was large, dark, and hairy. I have looked into Bigfoot sightings before, but have never connected it with Mount Graham. I do now. On to the next story. 
in Yavapi County in Arizona on the Thumb Butte Loop in Prescott next to the city park. While driving, I spotted a reddish-brown ape-like creature. I stopped the car immediately and observed the creature. The hair on his arms was longer than the rest. It appeared to have little or no neck. It appeared to be very muscular and covered ground quickly. It was hard to judge the height of the creature because of the distance and shock, but I knew it was tall. It walked in the tree line, and there was a gap in the trees about 75 meters long. I watched this creature walk through the opening. I remember his arms swinging, and he only looked forward. I estimated, through my military experience, that it was 100 meters from my position. I was sitting in the car with my head turned, looking out the back and side window. I estimate that I saw him for at least 10 seconds, although it seemed longer. It was turning into dusk, although there was plenty of light for me to see. It was a pine forest, 100 meters from the road. There were no structures, although the park was only a quarter of a mile or less from the incident. What I remember most is my mind was wrestling with the thought that what I was seeing was not supposed to exist, yet I was viewing it. It was the most unsettling experience. What I tell you is the truth. I've never told anyone out of fear of ridicule and having my sanity questioned. On to the next story. In Coconino County, between Sedona and Flagstaff in Arizona, my family at the time were very much into the whole camping thing. And to this day, I still hunt and fish whenever the opportunity presents itself. We went somewhere in the Oak Creek Canyon, Slide Rock area, and camped along the river. As usual, I took off on my own to fish. I was fishing along the bank. Behind me, the forest was heavily treed with dense underbrush. I heard footsteps. Not your typical steps, but heavy, thumping steps. When I turned to look, I saw nothing, and the thumping seemed to stop. When I decided to get back to the more serious business of trout fishing, I heard it again. I looked around again, and this time, when it stopped, I heard very heavy, deep breathing. I was scared, too, and flattened my back against a tree. Trying to peer around, I searched for the source of the noise, but could not locate it. I waited. I tried to make myself small. I was only 13. I stayed still for 20 minutes with my back pressed flat against the tree, trying to look around without moving much. All the while, I could hear that thumping, walking sound, and sometimes breathing. It sounded so close. Finally, it stopped. I regained some courage. I shrugged it off as my very good imagination and started fishing again. But I was still nervous. I felt watched. Again, the thumping and breathing started again. And this time, to my left, I saw it. A shadow in the dark woods, but an unmistakable one. I saw a dark brown, black body, maybe three inches of fur, shaggy-looking fur. It was six to seven feet tall and was moving away at an angle. I was approximately 35 to 40 feet away. As soon as I saw him, he was gone. The woods were thick. We had a Labrador. He was very dull between the ears. He was not afraid of anything and wanted to follow me everywhere. He was not well trained and could be a handful. I found him all the way in the back of the tent, shivering from fright and refusing to come out. In fact, when I tried to force the issue a little bit, he fought me and remained inside the tent, scared and shaking. He refused to leave the tent. On to the next story. In 2005, I had already been living in Texas for nine years. I was employed by a large ranching firm and my job consisted of doing just about anything and everything you could imagine. Over the course of my tenure with the firm, the boys and I had been on many hunts in our leisure time. We had also spent a good deal of time hunting varmints and other critters that attacked livestock and the like. Without telling you where I was at the time, simply because I haven't asked permission to do so, there was a group of men who were making a side living hunting wild hogs for landowners all over the area. 
in case you are unaware, wild hogs are infesting the entire southern United States, and they're spreading like the plague. Not only are they doing tremendous amount of property damage, but in some cases, they are beginning to attack humans. Some of these hogs can weigh in at over a thousand pounds and are well capable of killing someone. Now, there was one group of fellas that had asked me during the course of my employment if I was interested in making some good side money, to which I said, absolutely. The side business of which they were speaking was that of hunting wild hogs at night. These guys were so skilled and so well prepared for what they did that they actually were using military-grade night optic helmets and infrared scopes and silenced rifles. I had been out on well over 50 hunts with these boys. Although many of their clients were repeat businesses, we never really knew where we may end up on the next call. The people who called in for their help were mostly concerned about the hogs coming too close to where they lived and their children played. This was a really big concern. As you could imagine, a hog could charge a child and gnash them open with their tusks and they would eat flesh and blood if they felt like it. The men trailered in what were basically heavy-duty, modified electric golf carts that could run around without any noise at night. Maybe a golf cart is a bad term because these things were more like 4 by 4s than golf carts. At any rate, we were well into a large tract of land that we had been called into for the fifth time by the landowner. I learned while I was doing this work that hogs multiply at a rate of 20% a year. So, if you don't do anything about them, you can quickly have a problem on your hands. There are millions of them in the United States, as we speak, and they are growing in numbers at a ridiculous rate annually. Pigs are also known to be one of the smartest animals on the planet, and these hogs are part of the family. While working on many of these properties, we had noticed that the hogs will take advantage of mingling in the area of the cows and steer. They seem to use them as an early warning system for potential oncoming predators such as us. Many times as we are scoping out some of the larger hogs we wanted to cull out, the cows would start mooing well before we could manage to get into range and the hogs sensing danger would quickly scamper off into the woods. We had to exercise great caution in that we didn't want to arbitrarily shoot a cow passing in front of or behind a hog as we took a shot. It was late Saturday night when we had made our way deep into the 2,000 plus acre piece of land when we saw a large herd of these hogs running and we stopped. It's not uncommon for a pack of coyotes to try and take down the young or the lame and we were thinking that this was exactly what was happening. Hence, the herd running. As we were focusing on where the herd had been running from, one of the guys said to the group, If I didn't know any better, it looked to me that there's a large bear tearing into a hog on the ground over there. We all knew there were no bears, and so did he, but we couldn't make any sense out of what exactly was huddled over this apparent boar on the ground. I was looking intently and saw what I believed was a long arm working on the fallen hog. It was only moments later what had been crouched over the hog stood to its feet, picked up the mammoth hog and flinging it over its shoulder. This hog had to weigh 300 pounds and it looked like a small dog when this creature picked it up, comparing to the size of the beast we were seeing. As soon as it stood up, two of the boys said, it's a darn Bigfoot, that's incredible. Bobby said, that's why that herd was running so fast. That big guy just took one of them out for dinner. We were watching the scenario go down at about 200 yards, so it was difficult to judge the size of the Bigfoot, but we were well schooled at judging the size of hogs based on prior experience. This Bigfoot seemed to be in mass at least five times as big as the hog, and the way in which it flipped this 300-pound pig on its shoulder was like you or I grabbing a 10-pound sack of spud. I mean, it just flipped it onto its back and started walking away. We watched it walk for about a 100 yards when Davy said, let's try and follow it. Of course, we didn't know if this Bigfoot knew we were even there, but 
We knew he was there because we were using night vision and infrared. We kept our distance, but this thing was walking really fast. A couple of times, we had temporarily lost sight of him as he passed through some heavy brush and thicket. About 20 minutes later, we could see that he was approaching a thicket where there were two others waiting his return, one being shorter than him and the other being quite small, maybe four or so feet in height. We now knew that this must have been a father out on a hunt and returning with a kill. The little one started to jump around like a kid having received a present. After a few moments, they all seemed to squat down around the hog, apparently feasting on it. We eased on out of there, and at sunup, had told the landowner what we had seen. He was real interested, as you could well imagine. Later that afternoon, we had agreed to meet up and head back to where we had seen them. At about 5 p.m., we made our way into the spot where we had seen the meeting. There was a small pack of coyotes gathered around the spot. We drove in and spooked them off to expose what was the remains of the hog. As it turns out, what was left, which wasn't much, was the carcass of a much bigger hog than we had anticipated. This hog, before it was eaten, had to be all of 700 pounds, which is nearing monster size for these critters. This also meant that the Bigfoot was even stronger and larger than we had thought, judging the size of the hog against what we thought the Bigfoot size was. Looking now at this hog, I would have to say that the Bigfoot was well over 2,000 pounds and, more than likely, well over 10 feet tall based on what we had seen the night before. The landowner asked us why we didn't bag it and, to a man, we had no answer. To us, I guess it didn't seem like the right thing to do at the time. We were all just fascinated by the sheer spectacle of seeing the thing. Nobody had even mentioned pulling the trigger or dispatching it when we had the chance. Think about picking up 700 pounds and throwing it over your shoulder. If by some chance you can make sense out of that, now think about walking a mile in the brush with that hog on your back. The sheer strength and endurance of these monsters is incredible. This size hog would have attacked you or me and could have easily killed us. And yet somehow this Bigfoot was able to take it down in the open field and kill it. I only wish I had been looking in that direction when the takedown had occurred. That would have been truly amazing to watch. On to the next one. In 1941, Reverend Lepton Harpool was deep in the Gum Creek bottoms hunting small game when suddenly the hunter found himself becoming the hunted. Out of nowhere, a mysterious animal resembling a large baboon sprang down from a nearby tree, narrowly missing Harpool, who unsuccessfully tried to smash the beast with his gun's barrel. Once the beast regained its footing, the agitated monster rose up on its back leg and prepared for another ferocious charge. Instead of simply shooting the beast dead in its track, Harpole blasted two warning shots into the air. According to the 1946 issue of Hoosier Folklore, the gun blast sent the creature retreating into the woods. Even if you chalk this up as a win for the hunter, the beast would soon get its revenge. Soon after Harpole's hair-raising encounter, hound folk began reporting hearing piercing loud screams and shrill howls that began to haunt the quaintness of the night, while hunters discovered large, unknown prints throughout the woods. Prints that the Freeport Journal Standard stated were similar to a raccoon but four times as large. Deprived of its feast of harpole, the Carbondale Free Press reported that the creature resorted to easier prey killing a dog which a bonnie farmer had set on its trail after hearing its terrorizing screams. Eventually, the beast searched for additional victims and began frightening the local school children an act that served as the final straw for a community that was anxious to rid itself of the sinister beast. In March of 1942, fed-up town folk decided that in order to end the creature's terror once and for all, they needed a good old-fashioned monster hunt. The ensuing hunt was scheduled for Sunday, March 28th. The Carbondale Free Press previewed the massive hunt, writing, Men of the community will beat the thickets and scour the deep woods in search of a beast described by eyewitnesses 
as probably an unusually large monkey or baboon. When the day of the hunt arrived, a scene straight out of Frankenstein greeted onlookers at the James R. Reed door when over 1,500 armed men showed up, all eager to put down the marauding menace. The only thing missing were the torches and the pitchfork. Even with the outlandish number of volunteers, the hunt ended up being a bust. The Edwardsville Intelligencer reported that hunters bagged only a large hoot owl and several crows in their fruitless search for the what is it. The hunt, however, was successful for one J.R. Reed, an enterprising entrepreneur who completely sold out his supply of candy bars, soda, water, and lunch meat. Many involved in the case, including Harpole, believed that the mysterious killer was simply an overgrown monkey or baboon. For those wondering what a monkey or baboon could possibly be doing in the wilds of Illinois, blame it on the circus. The origins of this monster, like many other reports of out-of-place animals, was thought to be that of an escapee from a traveling circus or carnival. Whatever the creature was, it was by no means finished with its frightening hijinks. Soon after the planned hunt failed, several small towns near and far began reporting that they too were being inhabited by the Mount Vernon monster. Eventually, things calmed down until seven years later, in 1949, when another odd animal decided to plague the area. The Mount Vernon Register News told of odd sounds of those of a crying child being reported in North Mount Vernon. This time, the creature took the shape of a large cat that had carried away several chickens from the nearby town of Ashley. Most likely a cougar, panther, mountain lion, or puma, the new out-of-place animal certainly only aided to the already frayed nerves of the region. On to the next one. A member of a farm family saw what they said was an 11-foot-tall hairy creature outside and found 18-inch-long footprints the following morning. This was in Steinbach in Manitoba in Canada. On to the next one. In the little Saskatchewan First Nation Reserve near Gypsonville in Manitoba, there were several witnesses of the Bigfoot. Clifford Shorting, Norman Shorting, Ivor Traverse, David Thompson, and others saw an eight-foot-tall Bigfoot that was black in color and with green eyes. There were also sightings in the area of the reservation. On to the next one. Near St. Ambrose in Manitoba, it was my ninth birthday. I had my cousins and my aunt and uncle over to celebrate my birthday. My parents had gotten me a new bike that year. I let my cousin ride my bike when the pedal kept falling off and he had left my bike on the outside of the fence. My dad told me, you better go and get your bike before someone runs it over or takes it. So I go outside to get my bike. I was knelt down to fix my pedal when my aunt was screaming at me to go to her or to run into the house. My grandmother was standing in front of her screen door, was also very upset screaming. I then stood up and looked at what my aunt was pointing at. It was a hairy thing. It was slim with arms past its knees and it turned to look at me. It was quiet and there was no smell. It was a light brownish gray. It was no threat to me, but I looked at my aunt and she was still screaming. I dropped my pedal and ran into the house and told my dad and my uncle what I'd seen. My dad and my uncle ran outside to go and investigate what I had seen. There were footprints. My uncle kept a cast of one, but it is now gone. I don't know whatever happened to it. I think he gave it away to someone in the state. He passed away 17 years ago. I know what I saw was real. I remember it like it was yesterday. My dad and my uncle went to investigate what I had seen, but only footprints were seen. A cast was taken, but it is now lost or given away. There were three witnesses. 
My aunt was screaming at me to go into the house or to go to her, and my grandmother was also screaming at her screen door, which was about a hundred feet away. I haven't heard of anyone ever seeing anything, but report of a woman screaming was heard, and there was never any explanation to the scream. It was 8.30 in the evening, and it was still light out. It was a very nice evening. There were only dirt roads at the time, and it was a very bushy area. It was going towards what I assume were the marshes or the beach area. On to the next one. Don Cunningham, a constable with the Dakota Ojibwe Tribal Council, thought that he saw a deer on the side of the road as he drove his wife and children to Winnipeg in Manitoba. This deer then stood up on its hind legs. It was man-sized and covered with brown fur and with a white head and a light gray beard. Cunningham chased the creature which ran like a monkey. Later, he found footprints that were 16 inches across and looked like human hands. On to the next one. Where Manitoba Highway 315 crosses the Black River, not far from Black Lake in Nopening Provincial Park, the canoe trip starting point is at the River Bridge. Canoe downstream west for about 8 to 10 hours. A few portages and light rapids to run. I believe the lake we camped at is called Little Black Lake. The nearest town was probably Bisset, Manitoba. I can't say exactly if I had an encounter with a Bigfoot or not, but after reading several accounts I found online, I found some similarities with other encounters. I was on a three-day canoeing trip with a friend just east of No Piming Provincial Park in eastern Manitoba, canoeing west from Highway 315 on the Black River. While canoe trips on this river are relatively popular, it is a rather remote area with marshland, coniferous forests, a lot of exposed rocks and cliffs, and many small lakes, streams, etc. After a full day of canoeing, we arrived at a small lake. I believe it is called Little Black Lake. There is one good-sized island on the lake which is close to the east shore, probably around 50 meters, and this is where we decided to camp. In the early evening, not long before sunset, we began to prepare our dinner. It was an extremely calm, pleasant evening. It was clear, warm, and there was virtually no wind. As I began to prepare our meal, I thought I could hear a faint noise in the far distance. At first, it could hardly be heard at all, and I didn't say anything to my companion, as I just thought my ears were playing tricks on me. To me, however... It sounded like a baby crying. We encountered nor saw any evidence that anyone else was canoeing in this area, even upon our return trip. Gradually, the sound became louder and closer, and I finally asked my friend if he had been hearing anything. He replied that he thought he had been hearing something for about the last 15 minutes, but didn't say anything because he thought his ears might be playing a trick on him. After about 20 minutes, we could both clearly hear this noise, though now it sounded more like a high-pitched growling or whining. By this time, the sun had set, and the conditions were twilight. After a few more minutes, we could hear twigs snapping and branches breaking, and the growling was very prominent, though it didn't sound anything like an animal growling I've ever heard. I suggested that it might be a wounded animal, perhaps a lynx, but I didn't think a lynx would make so much noise breaking branches. Eventually, this creature was directly across from us on the east shore of the lake and was pacing back and forth. It was very easy to follow the sound. By now, it was quite dark, and we could follow the sound back and forth with our flashlight, and at times, we thought we could see twigs swaying as if being knocked but we never saw the creature. After some time, we started to become quite worried, and I decided I would attempt to scare off the animal with a shot from the twenty-two rifle I had with me. I fired one shot into the treetops above where the sounds were coming from. There was a loud echo from the blast, 
and you could hear the bullet whiz through the air, and I heard some branches break. Immediately, and for the first time since the beginning of this ordeal, the creature went silent, and then, a moment later, we could hear it clearly run off through the forest, snapping many twigs and breaking branches. We had several wildlife encounters on the trip, moose, bear, deer, geese, but experienced nothing like that night. I have spent many years canoeing, hiking, and horseback riding in the wilderness, but to this day cannot account for what this might have been. I've never heard sounds like it made before that time or since, and I've had many wild animal encounters. There was one other witness. We were both preparing dinner when the incident began. I've heard of other Bigfoot sightings and Bigfoot prints in this area. The encounter was just before, during, and after sunset. A total duration of about 30 minutes. Exact time? Unknown. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!